I'm Tom, the founder and CEO of Alp Orbital. Um, going to do a presentation just to kind of give you an overview of what we've been up to for the last uh, few years, um, but about my story, um, you know, what's got us to this point, and what the future really holds. So what did I do? Just press the left. Cool. Cool. So as you can tell, we are founded in Glasgow. Um, so I lived in Glasgow for about 14 years now. Um, moved up for university and just really never left. Um, started the company 2012, so when we were registered, so though I didn't really start full time until 2013, um, at which point we were the only PocketCube company in the world. Uh, now there's thankfully more than just us, because um, it was pretty lonely in 20. 12 and 2013 to be a PocketCube developer. Um, at that point in time, nobody had ever flown PocketCubes before. Um, it was only in 2013 that the first ever PocketCubes got launched uh, in terms of a, a timeline. And it wasn't until 2019 the second group of PocketCubes launched, which was our first launch, which was Alba Cluster 2. And a bunch of folks that have been on stage today, uh, we launched the, uh, the Hungarian satellites on that mission, and uh, Joe obviously was uh, involved in that one, but had the FCC challenges. Um, so we've launched 23 satellites so far, which is a record amongst uh, Pocket teams. So we've launched more than anybody else. We've done more clusters than anyone else. Um, we've launched more pods than anyone else. Um, so a big, a big part of Alba just now is, is launching folks. So many customers here today uh, that have launched with us and some folks that are going in the future. Um, and we've done that on SpaceX and Rocket Labs, so probably the two biggest names, the two coolest names in, in, in rocket launches just now. So um, I met Pete Beck a few years ago before they launched to orbit uh, back in 2015, and uh, we eventually went on flight uh, 10 of, of Rocket Lab, uh, which was called Running Out of Fingers, uh, and I can talk about that later on. Uh, we've also flown on SpaceX, and we've done another a uh, pretty historic launch with Rocket Lab where they tried to catch their booster with a helicopter, which was pretty cool. Um, pretty fun to be part of that type of mission. Um, and yeah, so we raised uh, 3.4 million last year from Y Combinator, who are basically one of the most preeminent early stage uh, investors in the world. Um, they invested in Airbnb, Dropbox, they're the first investors in a lot of sort of really famous um, companies that lots of people know, Stripe was a big one, Reddit was a big one. Uh, so it's awesome to have you know, top tier Silicon Valley investors get behind Alba and they were our first ever investors after being bootstrapped for about eight years, which was, was not a lot of fun, but had to be done. Um, and really the, the game plan with that money is to help accelerate our Earth observation constellations. So a lot of the teams here today are feeding back, having launched stuff to orbit. Um, but really, I think for the next conference, I think we'll see a lot more people starting to make business cases work with the data and starting to turn PocketCubes into potentially like a, a revenue source. Uh, and that's something that we've been working on for some time, and, and hopefully we're getting closer to that. Um, we have historically have provided uh, platforms, so Unicorn 2 platform, obviously we tried with that earlier. We've you know, sold that to different teams and, and built missions for them. Uh, we do ground stations, uh, so people that were at Alba yesterday, the Albaplex, um, we're doing tours. We have a satellite production facility for our, our ground station trailers. Um, do launches, obviously, which I think we're pretty famous for. We do tests now as well, and we're basically an end-to-end -end, uh, space company. We do everything apart from the rocket, because um, I, I don't really want to do rockets. It's pretty hard. Um, uh, some of our more famous big-name customers would be Stanford University, TU Delft, obviously, who are here today, you heard from them. Uh, BME, who've done Holo Space. Uh, Carnegie Mellon's another one that's quite a, a big name. Um, so you know, the mission is to really to democratize access to space, and this is really like what's been driving me for the last decade to, to try and build Alba and make the Pocky Workshop and, and Alba Orbital really exist and thrive and then really get folks uh, doing stuff. You know, we don't want to talk about satellites, we want to be flying satellites, you know. And um, you know, have, having been to many UK space events in the UK where people talk a good game for a long time and nothing really happens, you know, I sort of set out to just make sure we can fly stuff as regularly as possible and get Fox in orbit. And that's really what we're all about. And this is the team. So as you've probably met them already, red t-shirts. There's about 20 people at Alba just now. And obviously, without their help, none of this would be possible. So 
Uh, thank you guys for uh, for being helpful and, and, and getting stuck in. Um, yeah. The uh, yeah. So basically, this is this was the uh, Smog team's original CubeSat, and really the the driving force for me was to you know I think it's like hundred thousand to launch a one U um, back when I started. So it's quite quite expensive still. So obviously things had came down a lot to you know the sort of six figure range. But we were the first company that regularly delivered satellites to orbit for like five figures. That was just like not a thing, you know. Um, and a lot of companies didn't really want to do it, to be honest, because it was like a lot of hassle for not much money. So we were able to to make it work by, you know, having a really lightweight pod um, that we 3D printed uh, by aggregating different payloads together by running these events to sort of get people excited about the pocket standards. And that's really how we've been able to do that. And we've launched twice already this year with another one coming up. Um, I'm sure you guys all know 1P, 2P, 3P. Um, this is the Pion cube we launched. This is uh, Unicorn 1 we launched. And this is the Unicorn uh, 2 we launched. Um, and these are the launch costs. So it's between about 25 and 60K to get them in orbit, depending on the size. These are the Alpapods, so there's one on display out at the back if you guys want to go have a look at it. Um, and we've been flying, we've flown eight Alpapods to orbit now. Uh, we have another one on the pad at Cape Canaveral just now with SpaceX, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's launching next week, um, that'll be flight four. Um, I can run through the manifest for the next year. Uh, I sort of let her slide. Uh, can you whack that? <laughs> So this is a video of our integration for the first ever launch cluster we've done. So we've now done, like I say, probably, how many integrations we've done? Probably like eight, nine pods, something like that. So we've flown eight. We have our ninth one in the pad. And we started this week integration for the 10th and 11th pods. So they're going uh, early next year on a SpaceX launch. But this was the Rocket Lab flight. So all these guys, these were the first ever PodCubes to launch. Uh, since 2013, so this was the 2019 flight on Rocket Lab Flight 10. Um, so as you can see, uh, the unique thing about Alpapod is you can actually see your satellites once they're in it. Uh, so it's a pretty unique design, super lightweight. Um, and these are some of the satellites we flew, so the this Hungarian ones that you've seen earlier. Uh, we flew an IoT satellite, and then we flew um, a sort of, uh, I think it was my radar satellite, a Tracy satellite, so they're one of our customers as well. And uh, We've, we've flown a bunch of them again as well uh, in the recent flight with uh, the, uh, the Rocket Lab guys. So that's what it looks like. Next slide. Next slide. Go. Um, so yeah, obviously Constantine's done a talk on Unicorn 2. So Unicorn 2 is probably the first PogCube to really get into mass production. Um, we designed, we started developing Unicorn 2 uh, 2017. So we done Unicorn 1 uh, roughly about a year to design Unicorn 1 and then it sat on the shelf because we can get a launch. Um, and we bought a launch, but we got delayed. We eventually got delayed six, five years and then I canceled the, the launch and then on the sixth year that launch actually did go and we, we didn't go on it. So we flew on an Alba launch, but before Alba launch came around, people were in six years to fly Paul Cubes, which is like, sounds crazy just now, but that was, that was the state of the art, unfortunately. Um, it's incredibly painful. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that's, it was 2017, we, we developed Unicorn 2 with uh, some ESA, uh, it's an ESA project, um, uh, an Arte's project. And really the goal of Unicorn 2 was to try and build the first sort of like, real satellite uh, sort of doing something useful platform. So the accusation of PogCubes back then was, we're well, sure you can make it small, but it's only gonna go beep, and nobody really cares about a satellite that goes beep. And I've always believed that PogCubes could do amazing things if we have a big enough community and we put enough resources into it, and you know, we can get enough engineered manners into the technology. Um, that's always been my belief, you know, it's a lack of uh, engineering man decades or centuries, you know, and, and that's what the bigger satellites have behind them is, you know, tens of thousands of, of, of man centuries of, of uh, engineering time and, and, and these sort of things. And that's really what we needed to do. Um, so we're able to build a satellite with an ADCS, with a payload bay, with a big wing for power, uh, with a pointing system. And that's the team back in 2019 after 
a month of like really late nights. I think we were finishing like 2 a.m. every night. So um, Andy and Constantine for sure, uh, I think uh, who, are, who are up there will remember that. And a bunch of other folks that were helping out back then. Um, Ben's and uh, I'm trying to think who's still there. Caius was there as well. Alan and Martin. Um, a few other folks that are no longer with us. Um, but these are the two satellites here. This is 2B and 2C. And the album pod that they launched in. I click that one. Yeah, so earlier when they're saying, like, what was the feeling with the launch? I mean, this was the launch, and um, it was pretty stressful because it was like eight in the morning, um, UK time. And that was when we first launched something off, off the earth, um, which was pretty nuts. Because um, the thing is, I'd literally had seven years of people saying, have you launched a satellite yet? Like, like you know, obviously I've been saying, I'm going to launch a satellite, and talking to people about launching a satellite. And just to finally actually like, just launch something was like such a relief, you know, because, um, you know, it's pretty hard to launch a satellite, you know, it's getting easier, but it's like still a hard game to get, you know, to that level. Um, so we, we flew and running out of fingers, and um, yeah, thankfully everything went to plan there. We, we launched, we deployed six satellites, um, made contact with the unicorn, and um, a bunch of the other satellites, you know, made contact too. So that was, that was amazing, you know? Um, so that yeah, was a huge relief more than anything. Um, yeah, go next slide. Yeah, so Y Combinator, so I, th I think one of the things that marks us out as a, a PogCube company is we've been able to raise investment. Um, like building a PogCube's hard, uh, raising capital is also equally hard, if not potentially harder. Um, and I was trying to convince people that um, you can't do interesting stuff with PogCube's and that there will be a, a market for the ultimate data. Um, so in 2020, I think, in 2020, we, just as sort of COVID was, was happening, we were able to raise a round of investment. We'd done Y Combinator. Um, we were the first Scottish company to ever do Y Combinator, which was like a huge thing locally in the tech scene. Um, and we were able to raise cash from a bunch of people, um, but our, our biggest investor is one of the co-founders of Skype. Um, we have other sort of famous investors. Um, Joe Montana, the American footballer, is an investor. We have um, CEO of Fitbit, James Park, is an investor. And a bunch of just bland funds you've never heard of. So, um, so that was an experience. We've done Demo Day. We were one of the most popular uh, startups at Demo Day, um, which was just insane. And we, we had a lot of inbound inquiries for folks wanting to support Alba. Yeah, so really, like, what's the point of raising capital? So, um, you know, really, we want to ramp things up. So the aspiration for us is to build a constellation of Earth observation satellites to ultimately image the Earth every 15 minutes. That's the sort of, like, grand vision of what we're trying to do. We should be thousands of unicorns, ultimately, long term, acting a constellation to image the Earth in a bunch of different orbital planes. Um, so that's the sort of like blue sky, what we want to get done. Um, but really there's many stepping stones between here and there. Um, so the first of our business was get imaging unicorns to orbit. And that's something Constantine was chatting about earlier. Um, we, we want to secure on port with 96P. So we, we've got potentially launches coming up in 2024 with the 96P, which is our big deployer. So it's on display out the back. Um, like Constantine sort of alluded to earlier, we started the Unicorn 3 design. So we learned a lot with Unicorn 2, and Unicorn 2 is an amazing platform, and you know, arguably one of the most capable pocket platforms they are. But at some point in time, you get tech debt, and the decisions you make in 2017 and 2018 maybe don't really make sense in 2022. Um, and Unicorn 2 has been through about five or six different iterations for flight, so we're on the 2.5 iteration. And um, it just becomes a bit of a cul-de-sac. You can only change very few variables once you're in production. Um, total nightmare. Uh, producing satellites versus designing satellites is a completely different game. Uh, it's something we've learned a lot about. So we've been ramping up the Alba Connects, as you guys seen at the uh, Archies with the, the ground stations. We've also been ramping up the Unicorn 2 uh, for EO, and that's something that Andy and our manufacturing team has been leading and, and trying to make happen. Um, just now we're building a Unicorn 2 roughly every two weeks or so, so we have uh, probably about two a month production rate. Um, and we've built, I think, on the order of probably, uh, I'm trying to think how many we've built this year, but we, we bought a lot. We have, I think, about eight currently in production. 
Then we have another sort of seven, eight, nine or so on order. Um, so we're continuously just finishing them and trying to get them out the door. There's another two going up next month, uh, next week actually. Um, and then there's another four that we're prepping to go out as well. So there's just constant production of Alba for Unicorn. Yeah, this is aspirationally what it might look like on the customer end. Um, so ultimately we won't be doing 10 meter imagery. Um, we want to get a 15 minute revisit. This is with maybe like three or four different images per day. So you're going to start to see things move uh, in real time. So it's sort of a cross between a weather satellite and a traditional Earth observation system. We want to have the resolution of Sentinel-2, but the revisit rate of a weather satellite um, from geostationary orbit, which can get the 15 minutes, but it's one kilometer resolution, but the system would be 10 meters. So that would require an army of unicorns to, to make that work. You can start to see things happen throughout the day in Earth, which would be pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of like applications of these things. So we've done a bunch of LOIs with folks. Um, we sent a bunch of pre-order imagery with a bunch of people. Um, uh, the sort of go-to use cases are things like wildfire detection, natural disasters, floods. So anything that happens uh, quickly that's big, essentially. Um, one of our investors is a company called Flexport, uh, which are a billion dollar company in Silicon Valley. And they, uh, they're all about logistics. So they're really interested in how ports flow. So they want to know what's happening, you know, once the ship gets in. So are the lorries ready to to take the containers off the ship, uh, you know, as they space for the containers, are things backed up, you know, that, that's the sort of thing they're interested in. Uh, and this is an army of different use cases, uh, traditional ones like farming and things like that, and then um, other things. And this is the ground station, so we, um, for those who haven't seen the tour, we, we basically build Alba Connect on the back of a trailer, um, which, basically allows us to move the platform really easily. Um, so this is our first ground station we have out in Germany just now. So it's about an hour south of Berlin. It's, uh, we've rented some land uh, in a very remote location. So the radio noise is, is great. There's not a lot of radio noise out there. Um, we're far enough away from Berlin. Um, and essentially the thing's solar powered. It has its own 5G backhaul connection. And like Constantine was saying earlier about autonomy, so the, the aspiration is this thing's fully autonomous. It has been fully autonomous. I think the longest it's ran without interventions uh, probably three, four months over the summer. Um, and we're going out to do some more maintenance in the next few weeks, but for the winter, obviously. Um, and that's the node one. Um, node two and three, I don't have a picture of it, but they're currently in production down uh, our production facility. So those of you who came to the tour yesterday uh, probably would have seen them, but otherwise we'll probably tweet out in the next few days. Um, so this is where that facility is. We also invested in things like uh, vibe tables uh, instead of washing machines um, and bakeout chambers. So we can do basically the full satellite build qualification in-house now, which um, really speeds things up and allows us to hit that sort of two month production rate. And, to be fair, we, th we think we can go much higher in the production rate pretty quickly. We, we reduced a lot of friction. We're just dialing in our processes. So the, the, the biggest thing for us has been making the satellite design buildable. So it's really easy to design a cool satellite, but building a really cool satellite, you can build many of them, is, is like kind of tricky. Uh, and things that maybe don't matter when you can throw your whole engineering at one, team at one, uh, Versus you have like one or two technicians who've got to build 10, you know, that's kind of slightly different challenge and things have to be a lot more structured and there has to be processes and test plans and, and just a lot more structure, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a different game, you know, and with the facility we have now, we can do that and we have qualified other people. So if, if you guys are looking for like facilities, we, we rent that out online. Um, so yeah, the early satellites for Unicorn, the EO, is really imaged, aimed at Earth imaging uh, in night. Um, so basically, that's somewhere that we can be competitive with our lower resolution. So we already have, uh, so this is the sort of comparison. We're about uh, 25 meter GSD on our system um, compared to the sort of state of the art, which is VIRS, uh, they're 750. So we're much higher resolution. Um, and uh, FIERS is available nightly, um, but the ISS, which is similar resolution, is only uh, available periodically and requires a human on the ISS to take pictures. Um, and we can basically hit um, 
hit both these things. Um, another thing with Veers is they can't pick up LED streetlights, which is quite a big issue if you're trying to take pictures of cities at night because people want to see yeah, this big transition towards LEDs and stuff, and people want to see that in the pictures. So the Unicorn camera can pick up the full sort of RGB spectrum, and we can do that much more regularly than an astronaut can in the ISS. So that's kind of what we do there. Uh, cool. So we have uh, a few customers that we signed up already that we've announced. Uh, our biggest customer so far is the National Park Service of America. Um, so they're a returning customer. They bought multiple lots of uh, imagery, of pre-order imagery. Um, they're basically interested in there's like 65 national parks in America, so the, the order managed. And they want to see what's going on at the parks at night. Parks are big, they're hard to manage, they have rangers. So they want to see, you know, are lights on, should they not be on, that sort of thing, you know. So basically park management of like wide areas, um, basically surveillance for that. Uh, just to say, hey, are the lights on that should be on or are the lights there that shouldn't be there? Uh, we have McKenzie, uh, who are a UK firm. They're a tech startup. They're really interested in insurance. So if you can imagine a natural disaster, like say a hurricane in say like Orlando, they want to know very quickly where the hurricane path hit. And if you imagine every house is uh, on a map with an insurance liability, uh, the route of the, the hurricane and the damage will vary widely depending on which neighborhood uh, it goes through. So if it goes through the expensive mansion neighborhood with the fancy houses, then the payouts are likely to be much higher than going through maybe a less affluent area. Um, so they want to know that quicker so they can tell their customers, hey, that's a $10 billion event, it's not a $100 billion event, and they need to hold 3x the capital of the worst case scenario, so that means they can hold less capital, so that's kind of cool use case. And we also have Trade in Space, who are a Scottish startup company, and um, they're interested in the coffee supply chain in Brazil, so basically offering Earth observation services for those guys. Uh, I got another video. So yeah, this is, these are the launches. So uh, we're jumping around a little bit here, but this is the first one we've done. Then in January this year, we flew 13 on SpaceX, which was our biggest launch so far. And then in May, we flew another four pop cubes on the Rocket Lab there and back again mission. Um, so as of today, we have flown 23 satellites. And like I say, we've got some more coming up. Next slide. Yeah, when I launch your pocket. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah, so this is our manifest. Um, so it's not super clear, but hopefully you guys can see it. So we have the launch going out next week with SpaceX, and the hardware's already at Cape Canaveral getting integrated. So that's one pod. We've got. Um, Another one going um, uh, June now, uh, I believe. So that's uh, two pods. We've got uh, another two pods on the same launch in a different port. Um, we then have uh, Ariane Space Launch. So we've announced, I think it's public now, that we've announced um, we bought some capacity on the Vega rocket. Um, so we've done Electron, uh, which is the smallest rocket. We've done Falcon 9, which is the Probably most famous rocket and, and, and reusable rocket. And now we're doing the Vega launch vehicle. So the cool thing about the Vega launches is we get to go into more unusual orbits. So the SpaceX launches are great for early mid-morning, so anywhere from 9 a.m. to about 1 p.m. is where the, the SpaceX ride shares typically go, so some synchronous orbit, 500 km. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of opportunities to go like later on in the day. So like for our imaging system you've seen there, we want to be imaging all throughout the day. Um, so the Vega launches we're doing in June, um, they're going to 2 a.m., 2 p.m. LTDN. And we have a 5.30 launch we're going to in October, November time with Vega. And the cool thing about that is it's a Terminator flight, so we basically get to ride the day night line uh, time. So we essentially get... Uh, potentially a lot more power, uh, but potentially a lot more thermal problems. So that'll be an interesting mission. And it's, it's kind of an unusual orbit to get into. Oh, last slide. So yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming. And yeah, if you have any questions, just let me know.